Good morning, everyone. This is the uh, Friday, February 4th meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee um, meeting. And I see we have a quorum. So I want my first order of business is to make sure that all the members of the committee can hear and be heard. Um, and I will call out people's names in the order I see them on the screen. Kathleen, yep. do we have a quorum? Well, you, you one, two, three, four, five, six, six. No, we need to wait. Okay. Thank you. So we, we need to wait. Uh, now we have a quorum. Now we do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good, good counting. Um, we are. That was Mike. Okay. Oh, um, yes. That was, that was the whistle in the background. Thank you. Anyway, um, I will start this again. We now, we now have a quorum um, and I'm going to call out the members' names to make sure they can see and be heard um, as we are required because we're conducting by Zoom. And once I do that, Margaret will put the agenda up on the screen so everyone can be reminded of the order of business today. So I am just going to do... Uh, as I see the names. Sean. Here. Mike. Here. Paul. Here. Jonathan. Here. Phoebe. Here. Allison. Here. And Alicia. Here. Uh, a new member of our committee has just joined and I want, Sean can probably introduce her. Simone Christoffrey is the town's procurement officer and she's just been appointed to the committee. Yeah, um, Paul, is, she, is Simone officially on the committee? Is the period of time expired where she is? Um... Yes, okay. um, yeah. All right, so, so Simone is, um, she works in the finance uh, accounting office. She's the new procurement officer, she replaced um, Anthony Delaney, and she has um, comes with some experience in um, engineering and design contracts and things like that. So we're happy to have Simone. And Simone, if you could just let us know that you can hear and be heard as I go around the room. I can hear you. Thank okay. You. Well, welcome. And Rupert has joined us. Rupert. Yes, I can hear you. All right. So um, welcome everyone. We have a fairly full agenda. Margaret, if you could just pull it up on the screen uh, quickly, because then I am going to turn the meeting over to the Dinesco team. Um, as you can see, the first order of business and those who, who were at the community forum last night heard some of this, but they're gonna do a very preliminary report on the findings of the conditions of the site and site analysis and tell where we are on the alternative diagrams. Um, I, it, that should actually prove initial preliminary alternatives. Um, and then the, the main topic of discussion, I think today, because we need to make at least a tentative decision on how we're going to show ranking among our priority and evaluation criteria. I think we can take that down. And Jonathan, just so you know, I'm gonna call on you for a really brief report of the net zero subcommittee meeting. So I think, I think with that rather quick uh, introduction, everyone did receive the agenda. I'm turning it over to you, Donna, um, and you can, whichever um, team member is going to do first, the conditions of the sites. Um, yep. Tim, we'll try. Yeah, Tim, okay. Tim's well rehearsed. Here you go, Tim. Yep, happy to start. Uh, will I have the ability to share my screen? I Oops, think I, Paul I, is- I do, all right. No, I have it. Let me just pull up the presentation so we can speak to the issues. Uh, are we seeing that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to start with the buildings first, which have similar issues across both sites as they were designed and built within a few years of each other. As you know, um, much of this will not be a surprise to everyone in the room. 
basically a refresher, but uh, just to get through it. Um, as you know, the buildings have uh, envelopes that were designed in the 70s are poorly performing in terms of their insulative and thermal abilities. Um, the buildings are broadly non-compliant with the ADA and MAAB uh, and compliance with those regulations would require significant upgrades. Um, there are vestibules with controlled access at both buildings, but they are limited in function, meaning that you can be buzzed in the first door, but the second door is not locked. And there are program spaces that are accessed through the vestibule. So uh, that security function is totally short-circuited. Um, there is poor daylight control, poor daylight provided and poor thermal comfort. Um, the mechanical systems are of an older design. Uh, it's a two pipe system so that you're either in heating or cooling mode and in the shoulder seasons particularly, it's difficult, particularly difficult to give everyone in the building uh, the optimum comfort. Um, the classrooms were designed in the 70s when we had a different idea about how education should work. So there are uh, spaces that are not conducive to learning, poor acoustic separation. Um, walls have been introduced in the past for reasons of separation and with COVID, but uh, even that does not make the uh, spaces what we would have for contemporary learning. Uh, there's inadequate ventilation uh, in the building. Uh, the uh, unit ventilators that are providing heating and cooling for the space simply do not provide what would be a modern standard for fresh air in the building. Uh, and the systems as described uh, are well beyond their useful life. Uh, the facilities department has done a heroic job of maintaining uh, systems. Uh, there are things working in the building that uh, you will find in other buildings that simply don't work in other places. That being said, there is no amount of maintenance or work that can keep these systems and make them operate uh, at what you would expect for a new building. And then if there is renovation in these buildings, there are materials that will have to be abated um, in the ceiling and the floors in the mechanical systems. Uh, just to go through some photos of the interior and exterior of the building that shows the condition. Uh, the exterior envelope is single pane aluminum frame windows, which have been improved to an extent with uh, polycarbonate, uh, Lexan plastic, if you will, fastened to the frames, but that's only a moderate um, improvement in terms of thermal performance and actually a slight detriment in terms of daylight. Uh, the exterior walls are single wide brick with block backup, which has almost or very little thermal insulating value, but um, they are actually in relatively good shape considering their age. Uh, typical of classrooms, as you know, are oversized, poorly lit. Um, the spaces are defined with furniture rather than the building itself. Um, storage is inadequate. The, there is a sink in the classrooms, but it's not accessible. The non-classroom spaces in the building that the staff use, pull out learning, stuff like that, uh, are generally within the core of the building. So there is very limited daylight. Um, storage is an issue. Um, this is a good indication of all of the non-classroom spaces in the building. They're less than optimally functional and not exactly pleasant spaces to live and learn in. Here's a close-up view of some of the windows that uh, have been to the extent possible improved, um, but they are not what we would expect in a new building by any means. Um, many of the multi-fixture toilets are radically undersized in terms of the space that you would need for accessibility. Um, and that's um, consistent throughout the buildings uh, other than the main multi-fixture toilet rooms by the main entrances. Here's a shot of the main entrance at Fort River. Uh, we have the issues that we spoke about with security. Uh, you can be buzzed in the front door, but once you get in the front door, there is no further uh, ability for staff to control who exits and enters. Um, and then right off of the vestibule, there are classroom spaces, uh, which is not just bad for security, but um, 
those classes are basically subject to being outside as when people are coming in and out of the building with the doors open. Uh, the last pictures were at Wildwood, but here we are at Fort River uh, with a similar condition. There are differences between the building that have uh, developed over maintenance from the years. The carpets that you saw at Fort River are gone uh, in Wildwood and it's replaced with resilient flooring. Uh, which is actually adds to the acoustic problems that you have in these large classrooms. And uh, unit ventilators, which provide the heating and cooling in all of the uh, classrooms and exterior spaces of the building are not the most efficient ways of heating. And they are also subject to being blocked by use of the occupants. Uh, I mean, this one is actually pretty good, but you can see how uh, the ventilation could be blocked and always does by users. Uh, another shot of the windows that you can almost see has the polycarbonates fastened to the frame that makes the vision a little blurry. And then the technology for education that does exist in the buildings um, has all been retrofitted. So it's often secured to the walls, uh, not up to current standards. Um, and basically added later to the extent possible, but not the most efficient or highly functioning means. And this is a simple diagram of the plan of the building, which would apply to both. Everything highlighted in red would require major renovation to meet accessibility standards. So it's essentially all of the bathrooms other than the main multi-fixture toilets by the lobby. Um, there are also corridors in the building separate from bathrooms that are too narrow for an educational use. Um, and that's the tip of the iceberg, really. All, all of the hardware on the doors in the building would have to be replaced. And then beyond accessibility, there are many things that we would talk about that have to be upgraded, but this just identifies the bare minimum. And so that was the buildings in a nutshell that have the same issues on both sites. Now we're going to talk a little about, about the sites individually, which have um, very different uh, sets of attributes. Um, so our approach to working on either of the sites will be a little bit different. Um, as you know, the Wildwood site is about 14 acres. Um, when you take away the areas of the site that aren't really usable, uh, the slope to the southeast that is rather steep with mature trees, the access to the Head Start, which will have to be maintained and contains the utility for the site, there's about 11 acres left over on the site. Um, and so with the parking that is required, play fields, um, you have a, a pretty dense site. So here's just a view that shows where the utilities are. Um, obviously, they're concentrated in the access road, but south of the building, they cross the site and then continue on to the middle school south of the building. So whether it's a renovation that comes off of the existing building or a new building uh, in the play field, uh, there are some utility relocation and some enabling that will have to happen before any construction can start. And then we're just very beginning stages of laying out how things will fit on the site. We've, you know, very recently come to an agreement of where the program is, so we know how much large the addition will be. We haven't really spoken about adjacencies yet, but we're just beginning to test concepts of how much can fit on the site and where it will go. And then beyond the program for the building itself, we are beginning to test fit the other items on the site that will meet the goals of the project. So this shows the renovated building, an approximate addition that will meet the program goals. It's one story on the northeast side of the building and it's two stories on the west. And then this diagram also shows a potential location for a geothermal well field that is about the size that you would need for a 115,000 square foot building. 
Um, obviously, those numbers will be refined, uh, but for this stage, that's about the size we'll need. And it's shown under what would continue to be play fields, which is um, doable in terms of uh, and actually convenient for access. So with this option, it's not difficult to place the well field. But if we get into a new building and begin to think about phasing, uh, more issues come up. So looking at the site alone, ignoring the mill school field below, this shows a field outside of the footprint of the existing building, which will continue to be occupied during construction a new building south of the existing building, and then a redeveloped site, which would happen in a phased manner after the existing building is taken down. What this does not show is an underground um, stormwater control system, which would most likely be outside of the footprint of the existing building. So all of the systems could be up and running on the day that the school opens or you move out of the old school into the new school. Um, and then within so and then also to control the amount of site that we can use, this is a three story building just as an assumption. Now, we know that that is an issue that we need to talk about, but um, this will allow us to maximize the use of the site. Um, and then what this diagram also shows as an alternative uh, is the geothermal field on the middle school field. Um, from a construction point of view, from a phasing point of view, from a functional point of view, that makes a lot of sense. We realize that from an ownership point of view, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if the word is politics, um, we may not have control of that site. So it's uh, something we want to talk about. But um, this is just the beginning of showing that everything can fit on the site. Um, and then if we do work within the bounds of the site that we own, that um, phasing will be an effort and certainly accomplishable, but um, something that will require a lot of thought. So just a summary of the Wildwood site, 14 acres, single point of access that will limit our ability to um, control traffic as it comes on and off the site. Um, but certainly the site circulation for vehicles will be designed uh, to optimize queuing on site and uh, do what we can to manage traffic. So Tim, before we go on, I, I don't know if there's anyone, can you go back to the next last slide? Is there, a possibility of using the play fields um, that are, I, I guess, from a property perspective attached to the middle school. Mike, is it, Mike, go ahead. Oh, I can't give a yes, no, because it, it, it's based on elected officials uh, on the regional schools and on the elementary school. I will say that it's, it's not used all that frequently by the middle school PE classes sometimes, but it's a, it's a big field down there. Um, so that would have to be something that would uh, come to the different uh, elected officials to make um, a decision about. Okay. There's also and the field on the other side, outside the softball field, which is in, more infrequently used by middle school, uh, right? Exactly, thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a big plot of land. Um, middle school doesn't often do um, softball, middle school PE during the school day. So, um, but that would have to be a conversation for elected officials. Okay, and, and just to clarify, I think um, the, what we would need is uh, probably, well, I guess it depends on how deep we need to go with the borings for the, um, for the wells, but we then would return it back to its natural state and would be used. So it would just be for a uh, temporary. Sean, you, you had a comment on this too. I think that was my question. What can, um, what can happen on top of the geothermal fields or what can't happen once they're in place and ready to go? 
Um, play fields certainly can happen. Uh, uh, actually paved areas, play structures. I mean, the less that happens on the top is probably better, but there is little need for continued access other than the vault where the piping comes together. Um, and that would not be under a structure, but um, the other fields that we've installed have been under play fields. Um, and so having that there is certainly not an issue, but obviously that it would be completely disrupted and have to be rebuilt as part of the project, which is a consideration, but the cost of replacing that field um, might certainly be a better opportunity than all of the phasing that would have to happen if this were done on site. So if you see where we have it fit around the existing building, what that is in the place of now is half of the north parking lot and all of the west parking lot. So if you imagine school functioning on this site, all of its parking requirements plus construction happening for a new building, having all of these things on the site together, um, it, it's it might, doable, but it's... Yeah, there might even be a benefit to the region to have a nice new level playing field, right? That's one of the things I was thinking. Our fields are you know, not always... Um, the flattest so that might be a, one possible upside if that happened it certainly it would be an improved field paul paul's hands up too um you're muted paul i have three quick questions so one is um the area to the east of new three-story school which is the wooded area how are you treating that um is that seen as potential building space that we could utilize um i think there are trees there but that doesn't inhibit building necessarily, or is there some restriction on that? That's first question. The second question is, um, are you looking at taking advantage of the slope to sort of build the building into this, the hill, which is environmentally, you know, a lot of times doing that helps with environmental concerns. And the third is, is there their interest in like formalizing a connection with the middle school? I think there's sort of an informal path that cuts through that cars sometimes go down even though they're not supposed to but um as terms of a second means of access egress to the school would that I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that rupert or the school district would allow but or want but just those are my three questions sure um i mean i can address them in orders so far um staying away from the slope with the mature trees has been self-imposed uh just because it is a relatively steep slope and cutting down that many trees often um it, it's people you run into resistance it, that being said um there is certainly opportunity to uh build into the hill to create more space on site as you say um if you can get the building to work with all of the things you need in terms of daylighting um some of your spaces that can be built in the hill that's certainly fine uh that would clearly free up more space on site to do the things that we want to do. We have not really discussed a formal connection to the middle school and whether that would be appropriate, but certainly if we hear that that is what the district wants to do, um, the site could be designed such that you have a campus that uh, improves the facility obviously for the new elementary school, but also creates functions that are easy to access and improve the campus of the middle school. Just just quick follow up. So the, and I think that when you look at a three story building is to most people in town, it'll see mammoth because of mm -hmm. it. Um, but if it's built into the building, it could present in a lower profile from the street at least, um, but still meet the needs. I think there's a lot of efficiencies in a three story building, um, even though it, most people might feel it feels too big, but I've seen them work pretty successfully in, in elementary schools as well because they take such a much such a small footprint. Yeah, the, the, the smaller footprint is going to be very helpful, particularly on the Wildwood site, um, with getting everything that we need to work. Allison, it, oh sorry, keep go come on. Yeah, so so I think um, one one question, Paul and everyone is if. We're, we're happy to explore the opportunity of utilizing the area to the east. Is there someone in town that we should be speaking with? Is that still through the planning department? Um, are there restrictions every, you know, taking down mature trees? Do we have to replicate them? That, that tends to be a consideration that we always have to contend with or, or just 
we'll certainly reach out to whomever we feel is appropriate. Yeah, we can help you with that at the, from the planning department, any That's of those right. things, yeah. Yeah, and I think the only other consideration is the um, trees to the east, you know, orientation wise, I think is what Tim was kind of alluding to. We wanna maximize the um, north south orientation for the classrooms to maximize the daylight. And so we'll have to take a look how we can tuck this into the hill. We've done it successfully on many other projects. So that's good to know that that that's certainly a viable consideration. Allison, you need to unmute. Thank you. Um, so I had a couple questions around the geothermal well fields. Um, there's two possible locations. It seems to me not that they both are needed. And I just wanna clarify that. And then um, when it comes to the well fields, what is the expected maintenance? What is required for maintenance? What, it, what kind of disruptions are needed? Because I could see one of the fields not having much disruption or interrupting child, the children's experiences versus another. Um, the other thing I'd like the team to know is that those trees to the east, those are basically nature uh, uh, walks and outdoor uh, learning spaces. Um, they have paths that cut through, through there to clearings that the kindergarten and first grade, second grade, a lot of the younger classrooms will walk into those spaces to do outdoor learning. Um, not that that's not something that we can always work around, but um, I just want us to be aware that that, that does have a function for the elementary school. So um, I just, I'd, I'd like to hear more about the well fields uh, repair and maintenance and, and um, how that would happen and act. Sure, um, you are correct. Only one of the fields would be required. Um, uh, they're both, despite the same, uh, approximately the same size. That they're probably within, you know, a few wells of the size that we'll actually need. But yes, only one. Um, maintenance for the field itself. Um, the wellheads shown as the collection of dots uh, will be buried multiple feet below the ground and will not be accessed regularly at all or ever. Um, there will be a collection point, uh, a vault, if you will, where the piping from the wells comes together and that may need to be accessed, but that would be in a place that wouldn't be in a field. And then most of the maintenance will be in the building where the piping from the wells comes together. So uh, if maintenance at the field itself is not a, a regular or thing that ever happens. Uh, and then we have limited, or we are showing at least one nature trail and we will continue to locate those and incorporate them into the design. But, um, you know, that forest, to call it that, as a natural resource is why we, you know, stayed out of that area with this diagram, but certainly we think that there's a balance that could be found, you know, possibly moving a little bit into that area, uh, using the site better, um, and, you know, making sure that all of the needs of outdoor learning, maintaining the site are met. Phoebe. Um, so I have a couple of questions. I know, you know, absolutely nothing about uh, really the MSBA rules around funding for site work, that kind of stuff. Um, but I do have a question regarding if we were to go ahead and, and put stuff on another site, so not on the Wildwood site, um, you know, how does that work with the MSBA funding? Um, and then uh, in terms of uh, if we're gonna do solar panels, where in this plan would something like that go? Well, I'll take the first question. Um, MSBA will allow you to utilize a different site provided that you have approval to do so. Margaret, feel free to chime in. Typically, they want you to have complete control of it, um, but because these are just well fields, that's different than putting the building on it. So we probably would need to confirm with MSBA that they would allow us to put the fields, the well fields on the other site without having complete control. 
Margaret, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think at the PSR level, they'll want something in writing that indicates intent and they won't vote on the final, in my experience, they won't vote on the final funding unless there's, there's a written agreement. Um, it doesn't have to be in place, but there has to be a date by which it's gonna be in place. They, they, they basically, in my experience, again, there may be other examples. They won't sign off on the final funding unless, um, which is the funding agreement, right? So this would be post local vote, right? And it's possible that even at the point of the local vote internally, the town might need to have that agreement in place. So. Um, you couldn't move out of feasibility, which at this point we're saying is about a year from now, without there being a, a I think, a written agreement. And then is it reimbursable though? Well, it's reimbursable, but there's a cap. So the geothermal system itself is, um, it's interesting because it's site, but it's also building, right? Because it's providing the heating for the building, um, but for the site, you cannot exceed 8% of the cost of the building. So it's- Well, you, yeah. you, you can exceed 8%, they yeah. won't reimburse, they won't reimburse, on reimburse you, they. sorry, right. They won't reimburse you. So it's safe to say that um, this would not be, they would not participate in this cost. It, it will just be um, borne by the town. Um, but, but that would go for, a lot of the site attributes and they, they just cap their participation at 8%. Even when we've done schools where we've been on a two acre site, we still exceed the 8% of the cost of the building. So all of that will be played out when we do the overall costs of the project and then how, how that impacts the town share. And then as far as the where the solar canopies could go. Again, we, we do need to vet the amount of parking, but I think here we're showing 120 cars and Mike will need to check with you on that. But this was for another project that had a significant amount of special ed needs. And so we, we assume that you would probably need about 120 parking spaces. And this is where the canopies would go. They would go over the parking lot. if that answered both of your questions. John, I just also wanted to add that we would also locate solar panels on the roof of the building. So that would augment as a whole system. Mike. Thanks. Um, first of all, I just wanna say, this is like, for me, right, where it gets kind of exciting, uh, where we're seeing <laughs> where things could potentially be. So I wanna thank you for all your work. I know it's been, a race, uh, you know, as more information comes in, you're doing these sessions, you're simultaneously uh, doing these test fits. And uh, so I just wanna thank the architectural team um, and I wanna see Fort River. So I wanna keep my questions uh, quick, but um, if you could forward one slide to the new construction um, there. So I guess uh, two questions. One is the area, and I don't, I don't do cardinal directions very well, so to the left, uh, in the scenario where it, the geothermal well would stay on the Wildwood site, uh, would that also be a usable site for uh, green space for student play? And then the second question I had is, um, how likely is it that, uh, and I know we'll, we'll talk about uh, sort of the green stuff and Jonathan, thank you for taking the lead on that in terms of subcommittee and all that work, but. Um, is the likelihood that if there's a new building will need geothermal wells, or are there the other solutions that we should be thinking about? In other words, when we see these maps, it'd be helpful to know, are we certain that we would be going this route or is that still sort of a, a, a looming question because there are other ways to achieve um, that status and that level of efficiency uh, as someone who's on the educational side and non-technical uh, side, it'd be good to have that in my mindset so I can, I can figure out the likelihood of needing these um, scenarios sure um one the geothermal field that's on the site proper would it absolutely be um could be used for outdoor play space green space lawn um wherever um it's located it could be replicated in that way um 
Geothermal is not necessary, but what it does do is offer a higher performing system, more efficiency. Um, so there, so a ground source heat pump, which is geothermal, comes with costs. Um, and then there are pros and cons of maybe using air source, which would have no geothermal field, but would have more equipment on the roof. Um, and there's uh, a litany of factors that would have to be weighed to decide which is better for the project. Um, geothermal costs more upfront. Uh, air source, heat pumps, condensers, VRF system comes with more costs down the road, more maintenance. So um, with Jonathan, the Net Zero Group, um, the committee at large will have to weigh all those factors and decide what is best, but it is not a given that there will be geothermal wells. So there, both Allison and Jonathan have their hands up. Allison? I, I just wanted to say um, that I was pleased to hear that there will be coverings over the parking spaces in the new site proposal here because that walk would be significantly longer for the staff. Um, given that how the parking lot is situated next to the buildings now, people are able to find parking spots that get them closer to an entrance so they're not walking in inclement weather as long. So I think making sure there is covering for people would improve their you know, quality of life. Thank you. Jonathan. I just wanted to ask Tim a question that we probably could follow up some more at the next uh, net zero um, subcommittee meeting, but is it also possible that there could be a, a combination of air source uh, heat pumps and ground source so that you know there might be a field but it may not be this big or would it like be more likely in your experience that it's going to be all or all one or all the other no absolutely there could be a hybrid system so um to to mitigate the cost of the geothermal field, you could design a field that um, handles the load on 80% of your demand days. So maybe it wouldn't provide the cooling that you would need on the hottest of the hottest days or provide the heat on the coldest of the coldest days, but um, a, a system that is a hybrid of two would, uh, and may end up being the design that is found to be most appropriate. So the, the field in fact could be smaller if that's the way we went. So, so just to add to that, we are in the process, now that we have an approximate square footage of the building, what we're doing is we're gonna run some models based on the two sites. They obviously have different attributes and try to understand at this level, how many wells and how deep we need to go for each site and then compare that to the cost. And then again, if it's, we'll come up with options for maybe 80% and then utilizing um, a, an all electric, I, I call an electric boiler, but an all electric system inside to get us to the 100%. So, so we're gonna start now that we have kind of square footages and we have the site attributes of both sites, we're gonna start that calculation to share and talk about with, um, I guess, preliminarily the net zero committee. Do people want to move on to Fort River? And just on the Net Zero Committee, I flash that quickly up. We've scheduled a meeting on the 10th at 9.30 in the morning. Um, we, we have a subcommittee, but everyone on the committee is welcome to attend that. So if we have more, we'll declare a, a group where we'll continue this discussion. So maybe T Tim, move to Fort River. Sure. Um, Fort River, um, as you know, was a larger site, um, 30 acres. Um, but um, as we, uh, you know, begin to talk about the constraints, um, the area that we're going to work with is, is a little smaller, um, still larger than the Wildwood site, but um, there are a lot more things going on here. Here we show um, the utilities for the site coming in and basically going under the drop off road. Um, but unlike the Wildwood site, there's no connection through. So um, all of the utilities on the site are for the building itself. So as part of a relocated building or renovated building, they will be part of the work. Um, this shows 
the renovation addition similar in concept to what we showed on Wildwood. Um, this shows a geothermal field just south of the building, um, all of which would be within the um, regulatory and floodplain setbacks that we have documented so far and will continue to confirm. Um, this is the same size field as the same size geothermal well field as the other site, uh, as the buildings are the same. Um, you can see that there's a lot more room for it to shift around. So with a new three-story building on the Fort River site, the geothermal field moves to the southwest corner where the entrance drop-off lane is. Um, this is showed under paving, which gets to one of the earlier questions of what can happen on top of it. Um, obviously, there's no anticipation or need for maintenance at the point of the wells in the future as you pave over them. Um, but this is located here um, to allow the existing school to function during construction, construction of the new building, and to keep the site out of the wettest part of the site. Um, that is not to say that the field could not be moved around for considerations as we get deeper into it, but it does fit in this area. Um, it's close to the building, um, which is one of the things you want for the system to operate efficiently to the distance between the well field and the um, mechanical room to be short. Um, and so just like the other option, solar canopies would be over the parking, which in this option is shown in a similar location to the existing building and on top of the new building. And then there are just a few slides here that um, reiterate what we've um, presented last night and in the past about where the uh, setbacks are. This is the conservancy zone, which is part of zoning, um, the floodplain, which we understand to be under review and will be changing this year. Um, and then there are setbacks to the wetlands that exist on the site and the riverfront. Um, and we will be meeting with the Conservation Commission. That is not to say that nothing can happen in these setbacks, but we are just mindful that they exist and doing everything we can to make sure that we are um, you know, share the town's values in terms of conserving what's there. Um, Jonathan? Or was it Phoebe? A quick question on the, that sure. prior slide. Along the south side of the property, is that a, a stream that's been identified as a kind of tributary to the Fort River that, that was, that creates that, it, that other lobe of, of blue dash zone? Correct. As, as the river turns to the west south of the site, that setback um, goes on to the. That's, that's, I, I would have to go back and remember, but I, I, that doesn't conform to my memory of, of the, the prior study, but that, that doesn't really mean anything. It may be simply that it wasn't identified as part of that zone, or I'm just not remembering. <laughs> also possible. No, uh, I, we, we are certainly in the process of, I mean, we're working with the information we have. We plan to do a lot with the Conservation Commission and everybody in town um, to make sure that we have these right and that we have the correct understanding of where we can do and what. what we, we start from the position of being the most conservative. Certainly the, the right place to start. Phoebe. Okay. Sorry, um, just a uh, trying to figure out on both sites, I guess. I, I think I understand where the the bus um, sort of loops would be. Is does this combine um, like parent drop off as well as like would it be the same route for both um, of those two things, or are there ways to separate that? We will certainly look at separating. Uh, parent drop off and 
bus drop off. I mean, for the sake of safety, convenience, I mean, there are a lot of reasons to do that. And the Fort River site um, is fortunate in the fact that there is a lot of area to do that. So it's certainly a prime consideration safety at drop off. Um, also, just manageable flow is consideration that we know that the exit at the north end of the site is close to a major intersection that can back up. So um, there may be uh, an overall reevaluation and redesign of how the site works as we get into this. I mean, this is um, this shows a separate drop off loop just to the west of the building, to the left of the building, but this is very preliminary um, and we will continue to develop it with that uh, functioning and uh, safety in mind. There's, I mean, this also shows a drop off loop to the north of the building. Yeah, I, I just to add to that, um, Phoebe, that is a, an extremely important safety feature that we understand is is paramount when when we're laying out the site to maintain separation of buses and cars and then um, people parking and walking in. So um, once, as Tim said, once we understand a little more of what's going on in the intersection up north, we'll certainly refine this and, and also the placement of the school too, right? So these are all preliminary, but we are showing the southern entrance to be wide enough to accommodate. I think we have two lanes coming in and one lane going out so that uh, we should be able to accommodate that. The, the other consideration that we'll have to work with you and our traffic engineers is ensuring that we can maximize the amount of cars on site and get them off the road. And so we have to sometimes get creative about how we are able to maximize the queuing on site. So um, this is very preliminary and we'll, we'll continue that. But as you can see, we have the existing building in play. I don't know if you can see the dotted line. So what typically happens is we can build the, the new building, move everyone in, and then we have to complete the site work. So we, we will have to, come up with temporary parking and traffic during construction, post-construction while we're finishing up the site. But we understand that the safety and security is paramount. Jonathan. Just to touch on that, that, you know, the fact that we're at a very, very early stage here. Um, for both sites, you know, you're showing a new three-story building. Um, I think it would be safe to say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but at this stage, while this may represent the, the volume of the space, you don't necessarily have all the inner workings figured out. Um, you're just kind of indicating a, a, a likely form, um, or potential form and, and entry and entry points. Um, is that, is that a, a safe assumption at this stage? That is absolutely true. There is a lot that we don't know that could um, adjust the shape, size, of the footprint volume of the building. We don't know um, what has to be on the first floor, what can move up. If the gym moves to the second floor, that has a giant impact on the footprint. Uh, if, if I mean, yes, uh, I will leave it at you are correct. Sean. Thank you. Um, this is just more information sharing. Um, you may already be aware of this, but there there's plans or at least a request for proposals went out to develop a couple sites around um, the school, the East Street School, which is sort of to the northwest, and then there's a site just to the southeast um, on Belchertown Road um, that could, it might impact the traffic study, I guess is what I'm saying. It, it might add, I think, somewhere between 50 to 70 units or something like that. Um, that's probably five to 10 years down the road, but just a heads up. Appreciate that. Oh, sure to pass those comments on to our traffic engineers. And we can and we can send you that information on exactly where they'll they'll go. Um, you know, I, I have a question. I'm looking to see if anyone else I noticed if you on both sites, um, when you talk about the ad reno, you have to work with the orientation of the current building and then you shift it when you're looking at new, particularly on Fort River, the shift is the, the north-south. How much 
that that orientation will affect lighting or other issues with uh, thermal, you know, you were describing, I'm trying to orient it. So you're keeping the orientation on this one. I can't remember exactly what was in what for, for yeah. Wildwood, but we can continue that next week too. But it just to say a little bit about. Yeah, you are correct. Um, we rotated the building so that classroom windows would face north and south, which is optimal for daylighting. Light from the north is not direct, so there's never glare and it's constant. Light from the south, um, the sun is high, so typically any direct light will be coming straight down in the windows and not traveling through the room and getting on desks, getting on teaching surfaces. So um, in the existing building windows face east and west so the light that comes in the windows is morning light and late afternoon which can be coming in depending on the time of the year almost horizontally which could create very very bad glare situations on teaching surfaces desks and it's just not good for learning thank you any any other i'm i'm looking for hands um of any variety. I think this is great. <laughs> and um, I know you didn't have a chance to get us all this information yesterday, but we will post this set of slides. So anyone who wants to go back and look at them, we'll put them in today's packet. Um, they will be up and I'll share them with you as well, but we, we will um, have it up. Yep, we will share the slides with you. So, so Kathy, just to kind of recap this whole um, portion of our meeting. Um, now that we, Mike and I have worked um, quickly, diligently to arrive at an approximate square footage of the building, all of the space requirements based on the ED program, and maybe Mike wants to touch on that, but now that we have that information and understand the required adjacencies and everything for the spaces and the programs, we can now start, as Jonathan alluded to, start really forming the building and looking at how best to lay out the spaces. And then we, we will need to have conversations with you all and maybe the community as well on what the priorities are for what goes on the first floor, what might go on the upper floors, what's important right, for community access and all of that. And we started that conversation last night. So um, that will probably you know, start really shaping a lot of the conversations that we have with the building committee in, in the coming coming weeks. And can you just, and um, when you come back to us, the ad renos that you showed for, for these two, um, I, don't, I don't think we need an answer now, but you, you chose to keep a certain amount of the building and add in specific places, just that clearly you have lots of options, but just to, a little bit more when you come back on what led you to those choices. Sure, yep. And, and I think part of, again, it's gonna be a dialogue with you all coming up with options. You know, um, disruption to students is probably in our mind always really, really important. And so how we're able to construct a renovation addition that's meaningful for the 50 years of the building, but also so that it doesn't completely disrupt the students' lives while the construction goes on. So there will be a balance between um, a ideal renovation addition, as well as making sure that the occupants can function in the building while it's being constructed. We will also have to, uh, and I say have to, we must um, share with everyone uh, uh, the, Fort, if the Fort River only options at some point. We know that's gonna come off the table pretty quickly, but we will also share those with you. So that will be part of our due diligence with the MSBA. Is everyone, um, I'm conscious of time. Um, I'm just, are we ready to move to the next piece, which was the one Donna thought we would be spending more time on, but um, it's, uh, we want to look at, have a relook at the criteria list with a couple potential ranking options that they've come up with. One is color and one is numbers. Um, 
is is that all right with everyone? We'll move to the next that next topic, and I will uh, I will try to figure out how to keep us on time. Um, if we need to, can we can, we can continue that discussion to next time we meet? I think, but at least get a bird's eye view. Phoebe, his hand is up. Sorry, I'm I'm trying not to be behind. I'm also managing home, kids home. Um, uh, very briefly, you had mentioned uh, having space summary. I didn't catch the whole thing. Is that something that we have? Do, do you have that information and does the committee already have that? No, no we, we literally, um, Mike and I um, worked last night, yesterday and, and finalizing it now that we have the educational program and, and a, a great position to be shared with the school committee. So we can certainly roll that out in advance of the meeting for next, for next time. So everyone has time to review it. We can spend some time going through that. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, Phoebe, this is Margaret. I just wanted to chime in. So it's, it's a standard form that the MSBA provides that's, that's part of, has to go in with the initial document. So you'll get a chance to see it, but it, it, it's basically, it's this big spreadsheet that is comparing their kind of standards with what is proposed. Okay, I think then we are willing, ready to move to, uh, uh, it, it may be the simplest on it, just to put up the two ways you've thought of ranking and sure. you've got one with an example on it on what it might look like. Um, All right. So can everyone see the screen? And I, it's kind of hard to see. Is that, is that legible? Is that all, all right with everyone? Okay. So what we've done is um, I, I believe that, that we have clearly identified what the priorities are. That's all been resolved. Um, we have also established all of the criteria to which we will weigh the um, priorities. And all of that has been resolved. I, I do wanna point out that at one point there was a conversation about having uh, under community, what we're gonna do with the other site, other building going forward. But at this point that, that can be weighed down the road, but until we really know what, what the town's intent is, we just felt that might, um, take away some of the effort and thought for, for um, what's most important. So for us, we wanna focus on what's most important for the project right now, and then we can fact fold that back in. But going back to the ranking, if I, I'll see if I can zoom in a little bit more, there we go. Uh, there was conversation about how to do this. There's right now what we're presenting are two options. We can do a numeric option where it's a four point system, zero would be it's unacceptable, and three would be highly advantageous. Um, the other consideration that we talked about were colors. So red would be unacceptable and green would be highly advantageous. And there's even a way that we, we've actually melded the two that you can have the color associated with the points. Uh, we've talked about kind of a, I even saw it in the Wildwood, how how Wildwood was ranked where they had almost like a consumer report circles that, you know, an empty circle was unacceptable, a half filled circle was okay, and then a full circle was um, acceptable. But that, that's hard to read and understand. So we're proposing either of these two options or even a combination of both. And then what we also wanted to do right now, because we don't have an exact cost, is that we actually have a relative co construction cost. So, um, for example, we'll have we're going to run the numbers once now that we have square footages and everything. We can give you rough order of magnitudes, but you know, say a dollar sign is less than I'm making up these numbers less than thirty million. You know, two dollar signs might be thirty to. 60 million and a three dollar sign might be over 60 million or something um, and then the other conversation is instead of ranking by construction costs perhaps uh, it might be a better matrix to to re rank it based on relative cost per pupil and we might have both because one does impact the other 
right? So for Fort River at 165 students, the cost per student is gonna be greater than the um, cost per student on a 575 student option. So what we've done is we've created, we'll, we'll be filling in the concept facts, the size of the sites, the usable site, the relative cost, and we can probably break this out to show the construction and then what that impact is on a cost per pupil. Um, if it allows students to move in in the fall of 2026, that would really impact the renovation or renovation addition options. And then net zero capacity or capability. And then we'll go through all of the criteria. So what I just want to quickly show, I'm going to zoom out a little bit just so we can see this. And we're not saying yes or no at this point. Um, this is to be discussed um, with the whole team is I'm going to just hide these rows so we can um, kind of get to this part. So for example, uh, if we want to start ranking them, and we'll just share this with you. These, these are just examples, but for a Fort River only school, full renovation, no addition, how does it meet your, the equity as it relates to your special ed pathways and impacts? Um, maybe, maybe that's zero, right? So that will inform you that here, what is what we did is we, we melded the two rate ranking systems. Um, maybe, uh, a renovation addition would be better, um, right? We can have more daylight, we can do all kinds of things. So, so maybe that's a one. Um, and then a full demo with new construction for the pathways, sure, that's great, right? It, it doesn't accommodate all of the students, but at least it's an improvement to the other ones. Now, these are just, I'm just speaking through how the ranking will work and we'll all have to work together to make sure that we're all in agreement with the rankings. Um, you know, transit impacts as they relate to safety and security. Okay, well, there's really no change here and I don't think it's great, right? So maybe this is a one because we'll have left students in there. Um, a reno ad, we can probably improve a little bit on that. So maybe this is a two. And then a new construction, we can certainly achieve safety and security a lot better with the maybe relocation of parking, et cetera. So this is how we're suggesting this could work. And um, these are just samples. It, we're, these aren't our opinions yet. We have to walk through it all with you because it's, it's um, up to all of us collectively to be ranking them. But I just want to, I'll pause there, Kathy, if, if this explains it enough. Um, yeah, and maybe go back up to the top. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a background discussion. On, they shared it to us with this, to a few of us before it came in. And one thought on the ranking on the point system is that it should go one through four, that a zero was an odd thing. But those are the kinds of things that are be easy to change. So, um, so I'm, I think we're looking for general comments. And then the other is Donna, when would we meet to make this decision? And at the next meeting, two weeks from now, would we go through going through these? So you can, I'll take Jonathan's uh, hand up first, but I just was wondering, when do we have to decide? Jonathan. Look, you can look, I'm just answer the question. My question can wait, sorry. Okay, so I think Jonathan is saying, when would we need to decide this? Yeah. So um, our first mission to MSBA is the preliminary design program. And what they want to hear are, okay, you're presenting all of these concepts and we're calling them concepts at this point. And which ones do you wanna bring forward to, to the end of uh, the study with the preferred schematic report, which is the point in which you're going to pick your preferred solution. MSBA is going to make us continue to evaluate, which is kind of silly, but the, the Fort River only with 165 students. So we have to bring that forward regardless. And it's our understanding that I don't think we're in a position, you, you all can correct us, um, that we're in a position to dismiss a renovation and addition 
at either site. MSB is going to ask us to do a reno add um, based on the enrollment of 575. So it would have to be at at minimum the Fort River site because that's the school that you've selected. But I don't think we're in a position at this point to dismiss the Wildwood site. Um, so in our mind, we will be carrying all of these forward until we're ready to make a decision on at what is the preferred solution. So that would occur hopefully by May, if that will give you a time frame. Okay. And and Kathy, it's up it's up to you all if if you feel that with the limited information we have at PDP to remove any of the concepts, but we think they're both valid sites and probably should be vetted a little bit more. So I'm going to call on Jonathan, but I, I wasn't actually trying to eliminate a concept. I was saying, when do we have to decide on the, the ranking system and then assign points? But I'll, we can come back to that. Jonathan? I just want to say, I really like the graphic nature of this, um, particularly because most of our work as a committee is going to be kind of presented in this format. Um, and even if folks are looking on a screen that is small, um, where you might not be able to, uh, you know, read the actual numbers, I think the, the graphic kind of filling in the bubble uh, with a color is a, a good way to, to communicate um, in this format. Um, Paul's hand is up. Yeah, do we have to look at all three Fort River 165 student options or can we eliminate two of those or and just keep the one that's most likely? And the second thing I want to mention, Kathy, is I have a hard stop at 10, so I've made Sean co-host. So if I leave, he'll be the host at that okay. point. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately, Paul, MSBA is having us vet all three for the, you, you have to do a renovation, reno ad, and new for every enrollment. It's, I, I, I can't even go there right now. <laughs> Allison. Uh, thank you. Um, just for ease of reading, um, as I'm scrolling, I, I, if I was on this and scrolling, I can imagine I might lose track of which column is um, associated with which category. So I'm wondering if there could be a, a bold line between Fort River 165 and Fort River 575, and then a bolder column line between Fort River 575 in Wildwood 575. Do you understand what I mean? Because I know that the, the rows have been highlighted, but if, if I started scrolling down, I would lose track of that. And I'm, I just wouldn't want my eyes to start to, you know, like right now, I would hate for my eyes to lose my understanding of which column is associated with which category. So I just don't know if that would, could be done. Donna, you're, you're muted. Yeah. I started to do that, but but you're absolutely right. And there's so much information and uh, we could even maybe put the criteria of the priorities like on a different sheet or or I don't know, maybe maybe rotate this or something so that you're not scrolling. Um, this is you, the old fashioned I, paper way, right? <laughs> Allison, unmute. Wait. Oh, sorry. I actually think it makes sense. I just knew that my eye would lose it if there wasn't some type of bolding in the border um because you you have created the dollar the color designation in the title um rows but it just can't follow through because every cell will be colored and if there's a bold line just separating them i think that would just i wouldn't want you to i personally don't know if i'd waste time trying to reorient jonathan i'm not necessarily an excel uh uh, expert. <laughs> I usually go to my bookkeeper, believe it or not, when I'm putting them together to get hints. But I do think there's a way that, you know, when we're presenting that you could have cells kind of float at the top as you scroll down. I don't know how to do it myself, but I do believe it's possible. So yeah, that's uh, another thing to think is. about. Yep, that is possible. Thank you. Yeah, and that's, I, I use Excel a lot and you just, you, you're repeating it. So there, there's going to be a way to not lose track of where we are. Um, right. You just freeze it. Yep. So is there any preference um, between A, keeping, should we be keeping both 
numeric and colors, the way Don has shown you, we can, we can have them both running. Um, and then should, if we don't wanna have a long discussion on this now and you wanna just take a look at it, we can save it and come back to that next week, um, next week, two weeks from now. But it's sort of when, when then the assigning to me, there's the second part. So do we want that? It's a four point scale, whether it's colors or not. When, when and how do you decide whether it's a red, pink, yellow, or orange? Um, and who, for, for, number, for some that are factual, it'll be easy. Um, some, it's more of a, to me, it's a qualitative decision. Yeah. So some of it, you're right, Kathy, some of it is going to be based on, you know, the, oh, I hit it, but, but the um, concept attributes, right? So some of it will be based on um, the cost or construction or whatever. Um, some of it's going to be a, a summary that we'll have to put together, right? That will say, okay, a renovation addition is just going to take 28 months, I'm making that up, but, but it's going to take 28 months. So now you can go down and evaluate how that impacts, you know, construction or how that impacts student learning. Um, another consideration would be, as you look at, you can see that actually we're doing our best to rotate the building so that it's north south facing for the classrooms, but each site might have different attributes that will inform the functionality of the building. And that will also come out as we start laying out all of the options. So some of it, as much as we're trying to do to make it not object, uh, subjective, some of it may be interpretive of what we're able to achieve at both sites. But I think it's safe to say that once we vet all of the options, it, it should be readily obvious which which options achieve what differently. Uh, for example, Wildwood, there's only one site access. They, there's not really an option for another site access, right? So traffic impacts may be impacted on that site. So as we develop the concepts, I think those will help inform the discussion in a relatively objective way. And that's our goal. Allison? You haven't ever heard this much from me, Kathy, <laughs> but um, I just wanted to remind the team that um, there are health implications to doing an ad reno that I would want everyone to be really clear about in their documenting of that. Um, there have been reports about the health impact of people working in the buildings and if that is not accounted for and really well documented, there will be questions and, and concerns um, on, on that. So that, that any ad reno that does not take into account the, the need to make sure that the health of people in the building is accounted for will, will have um, a negative impact. So we really wanna make sure we account for that and the cost that is needed in that. Yeah, 100%, Allison. Um, we do renovations and additions all the time, and there are health and safety issues that you have to take into consideration, and those will be reflected in, in the cost of the project. Thank you. So in terms of timing right now, um, we have, uh, we're coming back together in two weeks, February 18th, and then Two weeks after that is when we're beginning to see a report, and then we have to have a final report. So, um, some of the we're on what I think of as a really fast track, thanks to our design team. So, Donna, two weeks from now, will more you will be expecting to fill out some of this, provide more information, so we can be looking at this. Is that correct? And I see Alicia's got her Alicia's got her hand up too. But just in terms of we've got we've got three more meetings, uh, six. It's more, more weeks than that to get to a final report for the March deadline. I'm just reminding people that's the schedule. So Alicia. Um, I'm just wondering how we will be 
including the input that we received at the forums and if we'll be evaluating them on how well they're meeting the community needs also. And then I also am wondering about youth input and like we can directly ask students what it is that they want to see and how we can include those things also in evaluating which options will work best. Um, yes, thank you. And trust me, we, we sought input for a reason, right? Not, not, not just um, to listen and not respond to. So taking the information and Kathy, maybe um, we can work a little bit offline. We're assembling all the information that we received last night, right? We'll have a um, the recording, modified recording of the session last night and we'll post it, but it probably would be, and thank you for mentioning this, it probably would be a great opportunity to highlight what we've heard so far as a, an agenda item for the next meeting, right? And um, we've had great staff input. And so we were supposed to meet with CPAC today, but that got postponed. So they too are gonna have input. And then we can work with Mike um, about how we wanna engage the students. But, but we absolutely will share with what we've heard, make sure that uh, we address it if, if it's something is impossible and why it isn't impossible, why it is impossible. And we can use those matrix or the um, input as we evaluate the options. So I think, I think, I think maybe we can take this screen down then and just so everyone understands, you know, we're not going to have to make a decision of which option or configuration we want by March. We're just going to be filling out this grid. It's between March and May-ish that we go from big concepts to what's in a, what's in the school, what does it look like, where is it? And so that input from students, input from teachers is going to be ongoing. It's not going to be just this first community forum. So uh, Sean, do we have invoices we need to do before I turn it over, open it up for public comments? I can't, you're muted. I don't think I have any unless Margaret corrects me. Um, I think we approved the last one that was through December. Sometimes I go to my yeah. Our um our January invoice hasn't gone out yet, so you're not missing anything. Good. So I want to see if there are any more committee comments before I open it up for public comments. I don't see any hands up. So I think we are open for public comments. And um, Paul, you're, you're hosting, is that correct? <laughs> All right, so uh, Rudy, one hand is up. Okay, Rudy, we brought you into the room, so if you could- Yep, I Mayor, I'm just having trouble down. being unmuted. Um, thanks, I wondered if the Hawthorne pot, uh, parcel is still available for any use for the Wildwood site in terms of geothermal or solar. Uh, I know there was some talk about that for the first Wildwood school discussions. And I wondered, I can't remember how we disposed of that parcel, if it still might be available for some purposes to give us a little more working room for the Wildwood site. That's it. Thank you. And Rudy, I just, if you can, if you send that information in, we'll make sure Denisco has it. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Paul, another hand went up. Maria, we've brought you into the room. If you could unmute and identify yourself. Hi, this is Maria Kopicki. I live in South Amherst. Um, I wanted to comment on the current concepts that you've shown for both Ad Reno and new building. And it's uh, the Ad Reno has got a lot to do with the footprint. Um, you are maintaining it in this concept, the current footprint, and then putting additions on 
And I would like to strongly encourage you to explore other options. When we performed the Fort River feasibility study, we looked at a range of options for doing ad Brano that had different percentages of maintaining the current footprint to uh, actually losing, demolishing up to 50% of it as an ad Brano. And actually the, uh, the analysis showed massive benefits to going to a, a one third to one half demolition of the current footprint and then having additions uh, created. And a lot of those, the demolition um, were, was internal and mitigated against a lot of the problems with uh, daylighting. The, the daylighting was a massive factor when we did this analysis. So I would really like to encourage you to get away from keeping that current footprint and to explore more deeply and broadly options for addition and renovation. Um, uh, likewise, for the new construction, I think, you know, you've only shown a three story and um, it, it at least implies at this point, and that may not be true, but it implies that that is your only option for new construction. But really for ad reno, the, it doesn't, this is, I don't think a deep enough exploration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another hand has gone up, Paul. Tony, you've you've joined us. So if you want to unmute and, and introduce yourself. A lot of new information shared in this meeting today that to my knowledge was not in the packet or previously discussed or shared publicly. For example, uh, the fact that the second enrollment is now 165 students is new to me. Um, I believe that the enrollment study, um, the study enrollment given was 320. So there was no explanation of why that has changed. And then the discussion of the educational program and space needs, there was mentioned that that's been resolved, but, but to my knowledge, it hasn't, uh, the educational program hasn't been presented or discussed at school committee meeting or with the public as yet. So it's concerning to me that that's now being talked about as if it's completed. Um, so it's just, there's a general feeling I'm left with that there's work going on behind the scenes that this committee is not privy to and the school committee is not privy to and the public is not privy to. So I just uh, wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. You know, I, I you know, in regard to the Fort Rivers uh, size of the standalone, Donna, we will have to read, we, we reported it out briefly, but we'll have to report it out with an explanation because that's a number that MSBA gave to us, a new number. Um, so I, I think we can just, we can do it in writing, but we can, we will need to explain why 320 changed to 165. So I'm looking, Donna's hand is up um, for any other final comments. And it looks like we, and Phoebe's hand is up as well. So thank Donna. You. Yeah, um, and, and thank you, um, Tony, for your comments. I think too, one, one to Maria, um, that you're 100% you're right that we, now that we, believe uh, we have a draft of the educational program. It does need to go to school committee, but we need a basis to start from. Otherwise, we just have to sit here and wait um, until all of this gets resolved. So we just needed to start the conversation, but these in no means are uh, solutions or we don't, you know, we were just taking the square footage and saying this is about how it could work. So, so we will fully vet and carefully vet a renovation in addition. And a lot of times we have saved a very small portion of the existing building and created a large addition. So, so we will fully vet all of that. So your point is well taken. Um, and, and you will see now that we have a preliminary educational program, we can now start, start in earnest um, designing those options. Um, as for the enrollment option, as Kathy stated, we had a conversation with MSBA because the 
district has voted to move the sixth grade up. And so MS, we were actually trying to ask MSBA for a little relief on the Fort River only option because the sixth grade is no longer going to be there. They in turn came back and we're still waiting for that letter. Um, it has not been official yet, but unofficially they stated that um, based on the excess capacity at both other schools, now that the sixth grade is moving on, that you now only need a new school for Fort River only based on a K-5 for 165 students. Um, again, we're waiting for the final letter from MSBA, but if we wait and not move forward with any of this, um, we, we'll be here you know, much longer than, than we all need, need or want to. Um, as for the overall educational program, uh, Mike and I and his team have been working closely to get a draft put together that was again completed yesterday and will be formally submitted as a draft to the school committee, Mike, I believe for Tuesday evening. So again, we apologize for not putting some of this information out in advance. We're just trying to keep this moving as fast as we can with no disrespect to sharing the information. It's just allowing us to keep the conversation going, but that will occur. So we apologize if, if it came across that we were not sharing that information. Phoebe. So I have one quick question and then a request. Um, I'm wondering, uh, and this is kind of off topic, if we have an idea of how many individual people showed to the um, visioning sessions and then the forum last night, um, and not how many were in each, but how many individuals uh, along those three uh, things, because I'm, I'm, my mind as usual goes to outreach and I think it was probably a very small number in total. Um, so I, I, if we don't have that number right now, I would like to know what that number is. Um, and then in terms of my question, um, it, it, and it might be because I'm not, I, I am neither, uh, you know, employed by the school system, nor am I an elected official or work for the town. Um, but I'm, I'm, um, would like to request that materials come to at the very least the committee sooner. Um, so I, I believe, Kathy, you had said that you may have gotten some preview of the potential um, sort of rating structure kind of thing. Um, and uh, any of that information that we can get before we talk about it here um, might be helpful. Um, then we have the opportunity to formulate questions, clarify things that may not be clear to us, um, as opposed to seeing it first here and then trying to figure out how to come back to it later. Um, I think that that's, uh, especially for, for someone like me who is you know, very much of a lay person in this, it's very important. Um, and I think the idea, I, I, what I see happening is I see that there are a lot of people here, you guys are fantastic and know what you're talking about. And there are a lot of us that have no idea what you're talking about and what this process is. Um, and so I kind of want to represent for those of us that really don't, um, because there's a lot that's going to get lost in translation. And we need to be able to be very clear, very concise, very, um, you know, we say we want to run this uh, and be very transparent about it. And when the committee doesn't even know what's coming up next on screen, that's not transparency. Um, and so I, I you know, I'm more than willing to have conversations about how we do that going forward, but I think that it's something that unfortunately we're lacking in this process, or at least that's how I am feeling that this is being that this is lacking in this process. Um, thank, and thank you, PB, and, and I apologize for the not getting the ranking sheet. When I looked at it, I thought without more of an explanation, it would be difficult to do. But Donesco, the team got it to us by Tuesday. So it, that we, we, can, we can and will do better on getting it to you as hopefully a couple of days in advance. So that was a Kathy decision when I thought of trying to even explain it to myself, um, sharing, because they're Excel, big Excel spreadsheets, um, but that uh, that needn't have happened. That was uh, mine. And 
I think we will be in good shape for the February 18th. And both of these will go up today and I will send them, we can send them directly to you. So this was the beginning of a conversation and um, you are completely correct. I, I feel the same way. Um, so I'm, I, I know the one thing we didn't do, and Jonathan probably says that's fine, um, was get a quick report from the, the net zero subcommittee. We do have minutes on that and I will send the minutes to everyone. The video is up and we, we have scheduled a meeting at 9.30 on the 10th um, where the Danisco team will be there. And I think you probably bring in a couple people, Donna, who can talk more about this, that we're really focusing just on net zero sustainability, the climate issues. And we may we may have more information by next week. I'll, I'll rely on you to say what we do, but we will send that out. And I will share the slides that were given to us um, on the net zero, the first meeting. We, we have to figure out how to set up the subcommittee information right now because we're posting agendas, but there's not an easy place of putting up the minutes and the visuals. But I'm hoping to resolve that this afternoon to figure out how we do that. Um, but it was quite a good meeting. We had about 30 people there, um, including the big Danisco team with people who were co-authors of the net zero bylaw. So people were weighing in, Phoebe, from building expertise, from a view of, of knowing a lot more certainly than I do about these issues. So I see Margaret's hand is up. And then I think, um, you, Mar Margaret, I want to also be cognizant of time. So if you can make it quick, we are at 10 o'clock. Um, yeah, super quick. So um, one thing that was discussed last week sort of that I think is not on the agenda is we did, uh, I think as you all know that we had pinned a date for the next community forum. And in looking at it sort of in terms of the flow of um, information for that meeting, we, and when I say we, so this is myself and Danisco's recommendation to Kathy, um, we discussed moving that meeting to March 9th. So I can't remember which day of the week that is, but um, I will send out a notification about it to all of you um, and a placeholder invite for your calendars. But I just wanted to let you know that date has shifted a little bit. So that'll be, you know, the second one following the one we had last night. Thanks, Margaret. That's great. And Alicia. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I also just want to sort of pick up on what Phoebe was saying and say, this is a new process for me as well. So I'm really learning. And at times feeling a little bit lost because decisions are saying like we finalized this chart, but I thought we were just starting to talk about it and that there were more things that we could have been talking about this week is what I expected to happen. Um, and so I think like expectations, like what is our plan going forward? What do we expect to decide at our next meeting? So what should I be thinking about in the meantime? Um, like what is the timeline of this process I think is what I'm lost on here. Um, and then in terms of outreach, how are we measuring success and honestly looking to expand on that? Because I think while I think the public forums and the visioning sessions were great, I think they were definitely lacking in diversity and in diversity in age, in socioeconomic status, in racial diversity. And what are we going to do? Like, I think we need a plan. Like, how are we going to ensure that moving forward? And so I just, I, I know we have subcommittees and all different pieces working on these things, but how can we centralize that so that we are all knowing and working on that together also? Um, because while I would love to try, I can't attend every single meeting. And so I feel like some information is getting lost for me. Thank you. We will work on that. And um, and I would be, yes, the answer is yes. We, we can and will improve. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Margaret's hand is up. Okay. So just quickly, one thing we could try, Kathy, is as a first agenda item to just look at the overall calendar and we could send the calendar out um, 
with each set of meeting minutes. There, there is, Alicia, you might remember, I think it was at the last meeting, Kat, we'd gone through the summary, but I think having it handy for each meeting might help that. And we, we do, it, it, there's beginning to be a roadmap of what we're gonna be doing at, at each meeting. Um, yeah. You know, to, to, so decisions that have been made are still to be made. So I, Alicia. Thank you, sorry. And it would be helpful for um, like on that map to include things like that. So if I were to say, I would really like to see an improvement in outreach, then at the next meeting, we are going to be making decisions on how that can happen. Um, because I think also a lot of the things were like, great, we'll talk about it. And then like a lot of the things we said we would talk about at the last meeting did not come up today. So what is like, how are we keeping track of the things that we said we are going to talk about? Because I know we're on a timeline. So we can't necessarily push out too far the conversation of how we're going to do better outreach because we have limited amount of time. So I think like it would be helpful for me to be able to keep track of those things if we really had them written down somewhere and that I could expect and anticipate them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for both the participation, the comments. Um, and we do have, um, and just so you know, Donna and others have said, you know, we are really still at the beginning and the big decisions are in front of us several months away. So I think both what we can put in place that's more robust output, how we get better at giving you information in advance is all going to be improved. And Alicia, absolutely, there's a subgroup that's been talking about outreach in an informal way. We would be happy to have you join it. Um, you know, because it's, it's like, what ideas do people have? What can we do? Um, and when will we be doing what? So I, I want to, and Mike, Mike's hand is up. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just very briefly, because I have to run as well. I'm sure other people do okay. too. Just on the, the concept that um, was raised of engaging students, I do think, you know, as, you know, fortunately our numbers are dropping and as things uh, hopefully continue in that direction, Donna and I, um, at some meeting um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, she was asking about that and just the, the ability perhaps to engage students uh, virtually in some ways, but, but you know, also perhaps in person, um, hopefully is moving in the right direction. Because I do think, uh, I think it's a great point that some of this stuff can feel very um, abstract um, and uh, the online format works for some, but not forever for others. So, you know, it's a great suggestion that I'd like to come back to at our next meeting so we could talk about it uh, as a group. And I just, I wanted to flag that as something that a month ago I'd said, no, not possible. Um, Cause I did say that a month ago. And, um, but, but now I think we may be in a place of being able to think about how to do that uh, in some really interactive ways. And I just, I really love that suggestion and that idea. And I just wanted to highlight that, um, things are evolving and hopefully they'll continue to evolve in ways that allow for more direct uh, interpersonal connections um, and, and the student piece is huge. So I just wanted to second that thought and let the folks know that we should talk about it here, but also that I think it's more viable than it was a couple of weeks ago. So I wanna thank everyone and, and uh, thank you also for staying beyond the 10 o'clock time. We're not too bad, it's, it's 10.08. Um, I think we're ready to adjourn. Um, it sounds like we have um, a very full agenda for the next meeting two weeks from now. And anyone who has comments in between of the committee, I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, we are opening up a comment page. We're looking for trying to get an Engage Amherst tool up and running to solicit comments, not just at official forums and make for a more robust process going forward. Um, and thank you, Denisco team. Um, I know you were, you did a, a forum last night then got up early in the morning and we're back on call. Um, so thank you very much for the intensity of the work and the information you're bringing to us. And I'm going to announce us as adjourned. Thank you all.